It's really an honor to be here today. And it's an honor for the British Council to also participate in this project, which has got a long-term future because it'll lead to other things in research and exchanges among us across our countries. So I was asked to, to look at this perspective from that of a cultural institution and to share with you a bit of our experience here in Paris and, and that with the British Council. And you know, really what is the role of, of national cultural institutions in defining a city and how do we define Paris, for example? Well, I think one of the things is to start with, um, you know, the British Council in France, even though we're based in Paris, we're even uh, more active across uh, all of France. And uh, we're an integral part of the cultural community. We develop English language skills and many thousands of young people and adults across France every year are learning with our teachers teaching and teaching assistants in schools who are native speakers and also bring that cultural aspect of, of uh, to what they do, they bring it to life. We also support arts and cultural institutions uh, with exchanges between our countries and between other countries in our network globally. Um, we are present across 150 uh, different countries and we have face-to-face -face, online hybrid ways that we do that. But I think one of the things that you know we're, we're all trying to understand now is with the new, um, uh, the new ways of working, the new world, it's much more digital. You know, how do the national cultural institutions like ours define cities and contribute to the cities and their national and, and global um, reputations? Well, first I think it's how do we define culture? And um, we all have definitions and I won't try to define the constructs the way some of the colleagues in academia might, but I think we do, understand it as being something that is social. It's about the behavior and the norms and the, the knowledge and beliefs and the customs and, and the heritage that we have. And that that's created through learning and through our exchanges with people, individuals and, and groups. And we acquire it through that process. We create it together. So culture is something we co-create. And that it's the diversity of these cultures around the world that's one of the things that we share um, through our national cultural institutions. Um, so I think when we ourselves talk about, you know, what's our role in doing that? Well, in cities, how do we bring that together? And we do it in different ways. Cultural institutions such as the British Council vary, as does the Institut Francais, which is our counterpart, or the Goethe Institute, uh, you know, in, in Germany and around the world. And one of the things we do is serve an important role in bridging peoples, institutions, cultures across geographies, across subjects, across time. And we, we clearly can have an impact in the views that people have towards our countries of origin. Um, so the soft power around the ideas and, and the values and the things that we share. But then we also do have active, active um, convening and connecting power that we leverage in creating connections and spaces where those views are shaped and the reputations are formed. And we do that often locally or in a place like Paris where we have quite a lot of, uh, of activity that's in exchanging between the UK, between institutions, people, various actors in the creative and, and cultural economy. And so for a city, I think, and this is a reflection because I would have to ask the city what they actually think, but I, the presence and the activity of cultural institutions helps to really develop the relationships, the networks, the building of the human capital, I would say, that the knowledge capital that a city has and those links between people and institutions ultimately create new alliances that build their economy. So I think other colleagues will discuss that a little bit later, but I think we have our role in shaping that, in playing the, you know, sort of for the home country, uh, playing out a strategy that works and that, that meets in time. Um, we build connections and that understanding and trust between, in the case of the British Council, between people in the UK, and other countries such as France through our arts and culture activity, through our education and English language training. And Goethe and other institutions do this do similarly um, in their roles. And we actually collaborate with those institutions. So we are both peers and partners in various kinds of collaboration. I think we'll talk later about how that rolls up into, into knowledge diplomacy. Um, 
But then quickly, because I know my time is short and I'm just sort of giving a little bit of an overview of how we play our role locally. You know, I was asked also to talk about, you know, how we see changes in maybe the, the digitalization of the, the cultural activities and services. And, you know, what do we think that means for knowledge exchange and production? And obviously, you know, we all know that there's been an unprecedented um, transformation, partly because of what we've just gone through, which has made some accessibility, but not in all parts of the world, to the digital, um, to the digital space, let me call it that. Um, but it's also created sort of new actors who are in this creative and cultural industry sector who, who are also shaping that in very different ways than maybe the traditional actors and the traditional ways that we would view that. So I think we're clearly going well beyond the idea of digitalization of content in museums and collections and books and in the various areas there into the sort of metaverses of the you know, 3D virtual worlds and how, how that is creating new social connections that maybe we hadn't seen that, that you know, fit within this same frame of what we're looking at. Um, so knowledge exchange within that, you know, offers a really wide field of opportunities and we're certainly investing quite heavily in that. And I would just like to say the yin of the yang of, of whatever that is, is that actually we also see a real demand for face to face coming back for a presence that's physical, that is, um, that's complementary, that adds to that experience in a very big way, certainly on the side of production and creativity. We, we have a strong demand from the, the creative community itself to recreate those spaces where there can be these exchanges that are real face-to-face -face and maybe not um, uh, where we, we look eyeball to eyeball. You know, humans were still somehow part of the animal kingdom. And, you know, we need that experience in order to have that spark of creation that really is a leap forward and that creates magic in the moment. And I think this is where cultural institutions play a particularly important role. Um, and I include in that obviously higher education institutions. Um, I've got one last point. Do I have enough time to make one last? Okay. So um, I, I think one of the last things to, to, to sort of think about is, you know, how, what is in the landscape of the knowledge diplomacy, the role of the cultural institutions um, in, in these exchanges? And I think this is where it's really changing. I think now more than ever, we can play, uh, where, we, where we may be used to play, let me back up, where we may be used to play a role such as organizations like the British Council or Goethe Institute, we maybe played a role of representing our national cultures and showcasing that. And I think we still have a role to play in that. And that's very important work that we do do. But now I think we're also playing a very important role of being both local and global at the same time in that we can create these kind of unique convening spaces. They may be virtual, they may be physical. And today we're happening to do this in virtual, but that we as actors, we can use that ability for us to bring together and create these bridges and to make connections. And we can sort of hold the space, if you will, where this kind of new cultural creation can occur. And that's a role for us that I think is more important today in the context of what we've all been through. Certainly, we also have an situation, those of us with the, in the British context of the Brexit in the EU, and yet we have this long history. How do we create a convening space so we can reinvent, I would say let's invent new, what will be the next chapter of this amazing cultural journey that we're on together? And that that's a role that cultural institutions, we can play very, very well. And I'll leave it at that for the next uh, part. Thank you so much, Anne. I think that's an incredibly rich start to our discussions. There's a lot that, that we'll return to uh, within what you've just said. I mean, I'm, I'm, I know where to, where to take us a little bit now. Patrick, can I turn to you? Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me today. I'm really uh, honored to give, give you a little insight about the topic of cultural planning. Actually, I have to say one thing beforehand. Um, Berlin is not the city where cultural planning is a huge topic, actually. <laughs> Berlin is the cultural capital of Germany, at least, but, but um, uh, it has grown very naturally. But, but for sure, cultural planning is a big topic in all over Europe and also beyond, for sure. Uh, for example, the United States, also South America. So it's a huge topic. And 
it's actually a great topic to talk about because it can show you very different developments. And um, since I'm working in many different countries, for me, it's always very good and nice to have these cultural plans because they sort of show me that even if countries and cultures are very different, at some points we are all discussing we are all discussing the same things. You know, we, we talk about diversity, visibility of culture, collaboration, especially um, against the backdrop of COVID-19. I've seen that so many people have grown together because they realized through the possibilities of the digital world that they actually working on very similar questions. So then we give you a little presentation in this case. Um, one moment. Here we go. So actually, I'm from Berlin myself. I'm born here and I've lived in, uh, here almost my entire life. So um, I will come to Berlin uh, a couple of times. But first of all, um, I got some questions uh, from you. So I tried to give my best to answer them. So um, first of all, what, what is cultural planning? It's all about, we've already heard the term of transformation. Cultural planning is actually a very big topic uh, in many countries, as I said, because um, um, many cities, regions, even countries realize that they need to, you know, have a participatory process to, to further develop the cultural infrastructure to make sure that culture is prospering. So um, and this process is accelerated through the COVID-19 crisis. So for example, in Germany, you can see now almost every big city even is trying to at least to, to get a cultural plan done. So it's actually about, I would say, defining a new cultural policy for cities, regions, or even countries for the 2020s. Uh, and, uh, but very important, it's, it's also a very great instrument to either gather knowledge and also to produce new knowledge because together people you know, find uh, new ways of articulating themselves to create new stories and to create new projects. So it's not only about, you know, um, showing existing infrastructures and topics and knowledge, it's also about creating new knowledge. And when we talk about cultural planning in uh, 2022, it's actually about rolling plans. That means there's not like a strict plan and then you have like 10, 15 years to do it. It's more the beginning of a joint project, a joint um, conversation. Um, when we look on cultural plans, I would say there are two main things we can focus on. One side is that the cultural sector is subject itself to change. For example, the whole topic of sustainability. So how can uh, the production of culture be more sustainable, for example? How can cultural institutions regain customers after they have lost so many uh, audiences, for example. And on the other side, cities are realizing more and more that culture is in fact a very important uh, part of, for reflecting and transforming their cities and societies. So cultural planning is also focusing on um, the topics of relevance, visibility, inclusion, digitalization, and so on, as you all know. So cultural planning is really about creating joint knowledge, uh, relevance, and development. Um, and here are some, I would say, some buzzwords, some keywords when we talk about cultural development and city development. We can see that there are very big topics which are actually uh, uh, very important for all sectors of society. And um, cultural planning aims to give culture a bigger role in these processes. So for example, my, my own experience is as soon as we have a cultural plan, culture is more visible in other sectors of, of city development because then the other branches are realizing what culture wants to reach and how they can also integrate culture in their thinking. So for example, when we talk about the topic of sustainability or city marketing, or especially um, how we can integrate the inhabitants of a city into participatory processes, culture is playing a very big role. And um, cultural planning can help to to show these potentials. So uh, actually, I would say one of the biggest visions when we talk about cultural planning is at the end to have a sort of culture-based urban development. So where culture actually plays the most important role. I'll give you one uh, example. Berlin has a big city development plan, but culture does not play a role in it, really. Even if it, I would say it's one of the most important topics for the city, 
it doesn't play a role because cultural policy is not so visible. There's many, many activities. There's a lot of funding, a lot of institutions, but there's not this, I would say, this joint vision. So people from other branches could understand what culture in Berlin is all about, except that it's somehow important. So cultural planning can contribute to have a culture-based urban development um, process. So let me go, so don't use up so much time. So um, the next question is, how do the main actors in cultural planning shape the national and global um, engagement of a city? Um, first of all, as I said before, it's really about the visibility uh, of culture in a city or a visibility as a cultural city. So having a cultural plan is also a commitment. It shows that the city wants to, wants to play an important role in cultural development in a country or even beyond. But it also states that culture is important for the city itself. So um, the people who are actually involved in these planning processes are the people from the policy making sector, um, from the administration, but first of all, and most of all, and the most important are surely the people from the cultural institutions, the artists themselves. So when they come together and create a plan, they sort of get ambassadors, not only for their own institutions, but they're getting ambassadors for their art scene in their city or region. So actually, these people have a very important role in building up networks, not only locally, but also best case internationally. So just I give you one example. We did a cultural plan for the city of Nuremberg and we uh, analyzed the networks of the artists and cultural institutions. And uh, here you can see the network of um, the cultural institutions globally. So they're very strongly connected all over the planet and Nuremberg is a city with 600,000 inhabitants. So it's not the biggest city in Germany but surely cultural wise an important one. But you can see they're very strongly connected already so um, the cultural planning process helped to make that visible. And the other picture you can see below is the network in the region. So here you can see the connections between all the people who are producing and uh, being artists in Nuremberg in the region. So they all are ambassadors. And uh, since the cultural planning process, they're not only talking about themselves, they're also talking about culture in Nuremberg. And here are some more examples also from my own work. This is uh, actually a process uh, for the Goethe Institute in Ukraine since 2014. We developed a decentralized cultural planning initiative to decentralize culture in, in Ukraine. And um, uh, as a consequence out of this planning process, we now have a team of trainers, 20 trainers from Ukraine, who are actually um, helping people in small communities to make their own cultural planning process happening, for example. So people from uh, one process are now helping, helping people in other processes. So, so every small and mid-sized city in Ukraine can have um, their own cultural plan. So it's more easy for them to follow their strategic, strategic goals. So that's one example. And then go, uh, let's go to Berlin. As I said, there's not this big plan in Berlin, but surely there are many micro plans and things are happening. And I would say in Berlin, we have all these big institutions, but the really interesting places are, I would say, the, the interspaces. Like, for example, the small theater in Kreuzberg. It's one of the most leading uh, theaters uh, in post-migrant theater, for example, uh, which plays, for me, as a Berliner, an even more important role than the big cultural institutions. Um, and also, and very important, I would say, planning approach we can see now is the is that we have more and more uh, institutions or places who call themselves third spaces. Like, as you know, people have their work and they maybe have their school and also they have their home. And this is a place they also can stay at and, uh, uh, you know, have a good time. And this is actually one of my own projects. This is uh, the, the Hangar One in Berlin Tempelhof Airport. As you know, this airport is closed and it's the biggest open field in the city worldwide and uh, the hangar is still used in this case also as a sports place but we also um, contributed uh, cultural um, and, uh, initiatives in this case you can see an orchestra from from Denmark playing on the basketball court and it actually helped many people to you know find ways to to get access to culture who have not been in contact with culture before so it's not about the big plans it's also about smaller plans you know, um, helping certain institutions to, um, 
you know, uh, have goals and further developments concerning cultural planning. So um, let me come to the finish line almost. So um, it is really helpful to, to, you know, to view the, or to, to um, view the activities uh, of these actors through the lens of knowledge diplomacy. These cultural plans can help to understand the culture of a city better. As I said before, it's not only about you know, building up or showing knowledge, it's also about creating new knowledge. And it also helps to collaborate beyond the city borders, for example. And um, very important is it just helps to understand the, the structures, the, the questions, and also see some answers. And it helps to, to, to foster international developments. As I said myself, I'm, I'm working in very different countries in the meantime. And, and being from the cultural planning field helped me very much to, to, you know, to get uh, competencies to understand each other much better than before. So um, it really contributes to knowledge development. And to finish, finish this up, uh, I created um, a picture with a colleague of mine. Actually, it was based uh, what could be like the future culture manager. And um, you can also like use this for cultural actors themselves. And I think, um, when we talk about um, cultural development, cultural planning, and also knowledge diplomacy, we need more and more people who are able to connect different knowledge, to connect different um, areas of the city, um, and especially help people to understand them uh, better, each other. So for example, when I work with artists and people from the tourist sector, they normally don't like each other very much because they talk different, they speak different languages. So we need more and more people who are actually using knowledge, using different um, approaches of people and bring them together to create something new. And that's something which cultural planning can help at least to, to reach this goal. And um, so uh, what lessons can be learned? Um, I don't read all this, don't worry. At the end of the day, um, cultural planning can contribute to a culture policy, which is actually a social policy. And that makes culture uh, more interconnected and um, in best case, also more powerful to contribute to a city development. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'm looking forward to our discussions later on. Thank you very much, Patrick. I think we can begin to see the points of connection, but also the, the points of difference uh, between, between our comparator cities. John, I'm going to turn to you now to give us the perspective from London. Thank you, Joe, uh, and good afternoon, guten tag, or bonjour, or whatever we should say. Uh, of course, one of the easy things about having English as your mother tongue is that it makes all kinds of diplomacy much easier, because we now live in a world where we expect everybody will speak English, which is both to our advantage and our great disadvantage, because we remain even more culturally isolated than you might suspect post-Brexit. Anyway, we won't get into that one. But uh, Patrick, I'm so interested in what you said because in London, culture is absolutely central to the way the city is run. 80% uh, of visitors who come to London, including people who come for work, say that one of the, re the main reason they come to the city is because of its cultural life. And the, the, the creative industries, as we define them, constitute 15% of employment in the city and generate around 60 billion euros gross value added each year. So it's a crucial part of the city's identity and its economy. So I sit on the Mayor's Cultural Leadership Board, but I also sit on the Economic Planning Board because we see that these two things have to be integrated. And we have, I mean, as you were talking, I get my 150 page <laughs> cultural strategy for London. The idea being that in the same way that we have long-term transport planning, housing planning, we need to have long-term culture planning. So one of the elements of that is um, a, a culture map of London, which includes pubs, open spaces, clubs, playgrounds. Uh, and then aside that, we run a thing called the Culture at Risk Office, so that when public spaces and civic spaces, and particularly during lockdown, clubs and pubs who are in danger of closing down, they can apply to the Culture at Risk Office for support because we want to sustain uh, the dynamic life of the city. And, uh, and as part of that, in the cultural strategy, 
uh, I won't go on about it at great length, but four strands. One is that culture should be accessible for everybody. Secondly, that the physical facilities, as I was talking about a moment ago, need to be protected. Thirdly, that we need to be thinking about the skills and jobs of the future that are culture related. And fourthly, how do we project London as a world city? So one of the initiatives uh, that was undertaken five or 10 years ago was to launch the World Cities Culture Forum. And Berlin and Paris are both members of it. It's a, it's a group of about 35 cities around the world who share, occasionally there's an annual conference where until the pandemic people got together, but most of it is exchanges online. And I think one of the things that I find very interesting working internationally is how, uh, how much more dynamic and progressive and integrated cities can be than countries. And of course, there's an issue of scale, but at a time when in the creative and cultural sphere, governments wrestle with, uh, should they look at their creative economy strategy under the culture ministry or the economic ministry or the education ministry? And you say, you've got to look under all the ministries. You've got to be thinking in a converged way. And for governments, that of course is genuinely a gigantic problem, but at city level, you can literally get the key people around the table and resolve issues. And uh, I often think of a, um, a great Brazilian mayor, Jaime Lana, who the mayor of Curitiba, which is one of the first sort of real creative cities in the, in the world, who used to say, we have to run very fast to avoid our own bureaucracy. And, and by that he meant, we have to think in a converged way and we have to overcome the institutional barriers that are in place because we structure our, our governance and our society so much in a 20th century industrial society mode. And it does not accord with this much more integrated complex way in which we now see the world where everything is connected with everything else. We look at things in kind of terms of ecosystems. And, uh, and I think the conventional structures of government are find that hugely problematic. And of course, another dimension of, of life in London is we have scores of higher education institutions and they're integral to the life of the city uh, intellectually and socially. And, uh, and of course, there's many things one could say about, about the role of universities in, in the United Kingdom. We're particularly aware of the fact that nearly every city with a university voted to remain in the European Union virtually every area without a university voted to leave. There are some obvious consequences that can be learned from that. But I think that, that what, what the role of universities is in helping to generate the kind of convergences that we need is, is obviously a matter of great interest. And I think one of the, one of the issues that comes across to me is that uh, while universities have a crucial role to play as brokers, the, the real issue at a city level and at a national international level is the diversity of perspective. So to take a, a micro example, in London, we, because of the focus of creative industries in certain parts of the city, we wanted to try and disperse the creative and cultural impact of some of this work into some of the more suburban areas. And we set up a scheme called Creative Enterprise Zones for the, the any one of the 32 local municipal boroughs that make up London could apply for a creative enterprise zone. And we said, you, whatever the zone is, you must have five players, the local authority, the business community, the arts and cultural community, educational institution of some kind and community representatives. And by getting those five together, you can create something which is cross cutting and which genuinely provides a forum in which new ideas can be exchanged. Of course, the issue is how do you sustain parity of esteem between all those players? And I, interestingly, with the creative enterprise zones, where the, where the local authority tended not to be the dominant player, those were often the ones that were most creative and productive. Where the local authority was one of the key players, they tended to dominate, and so traditional, conventional, governmental thinking tended to take over. And this issue, I think, of parity of esteem is really, is really crucial. And I, I, I'm, I'm put in mind of um, what I think is a wonderful initiative in Indonesia called the Indonesian Creative Cities Network, 
which uh, started in Bandung, uh, which is a, in a sense one of the cultural capitals of, of, of Indonesia, but there are now over 200 cities in Indonesia that sign up to the principles of being creative cities. And the, the thing that I found interesting about this is that the, this, the philosophy behind this is driven by two universities in Bandung. So it's been very, it very much comes out of the academic world. Uh, and their starting point was to be a creative city. And by that, they mean a city where the, the citizens are engaged in the cultural life of the city and also where there is a dynamic creative economy. They said, you need, you need to have government, you need to have business, you need to have community, and you need to have academia. They said, it, those are the four essentials. But about five years later, they added a fifth, which was media, because they said, otherwise people tend not to understand what's going on. And particularly the academic world sometimes needs to be translated into the language that most human beings understand. So you need the media as a translator. And now, two or three years after that, they've added a sixth player. And that is what they call intermediary organizations. And they're civil society organizations. They are, I mean, in fact, in some instances, it has been organizations like the British Council that have played that role of being intermediaries, of providing a, a neutral space in which ideas can be exchanged and in which there is parity of esteem. So you don't have any one particular perspective dominating. And I do think uh, this is a, a hugely important issue. And just a couple of other points and then I'll, I'll finish. Uh, I was recently in Medellin in Colombia. Uh, and uh, I'm sure, you know, Medellin was the kind of cocaine capital of the world. And uh, in the city of a million and a half people, they were having literally 10 or 15 murders every day. And the mayor said, what are we gonna do about this? Uh, uh, and th they, they brought a group of citizens together, including people from academic institutions. What do we do about this state of affairs? One of the obvious answers is to improve security. But they said, all that means is more people get shot. We have to start somewhere different. And they started a program called Citizens Like You, on the basis that although there were 10 or 15 murders a day, the majority of people in Medellin wanted to live orderly lives. They wanted citizens like them. And they said, we are going to uh, reinvigorate the city by treating people as responsible citizens. So for example, they said for a period of time, we will not uh, have anybody collecting the fares on the buses, but please put what you would normally pay as your fare into a box. They got 90% of their normal income generated through that process. Absolutely extraordinary. The second idea was, let's start a, a little book exchange in every metro station. You can take any book you want from the book exchange, but you must put a book in place. So citizens are engaged in it. Then they said, let's have some of the streets empty on a Sunday so the kids can go roller skating. Then they said, let's have some cycle races around the city. And they slowly repopulated the city not by starting with the security issue, but by starting with some real lateral thinking. And I think it's only by bringing a diversity of perspectives that uh, you can get those kind of really imaginative solutions. And while the universities can bring a variety of perspectives of expertise, it's not necessarily the real diversity of different kinds of knowledge and different kinds of engagement that we need. And it seems to me that while, while we want to see that playing out face-to-face uh, -face and in the real world, one of the unexpected advantages in a way of the pandemic is that it has accelerated the business of communicating online. So the idea of drawing people in from anywhere in the world to take part in a discussion, even about a local issue, suddenly becomes a very practical possibility. So it seems to me these things kind of operate together in, uh, in, in harmony with each other. And, and my, I'll just finish by saying, for me, the, uh, I'm not quite sure what knowledge diplomacy means, but it, has a, it smells a little bit of soft power to me. And I feel very suspicious of the concept of soft power because it sounds, it sounds a little bit sneaky. Instead of doing it with a tank and an air force, you do it by, uh, you know, spreading love, fine. But actually, 
the, 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 the crucial point seems to me that there has to be this parity of esteem. And the, the Rowan, Dr. Rowan Williams, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury here in the UK until recently, said, instead of talking about cultural relations, which is a process, we should talk about mutual enrichment, which is what lies behind the process. And I think seeing knowledge diplomacy as a process of mutual enrichment, where by bringing together a variety of different perspectives uh, and really trying to construct a, a, in a neutral forum where there is parity of esteem, that is where some of the most interesting ideas come from. And those are ideas which may be applicable in a very local context, but nearly all these great ideas that are applicable in a local context, if they're really worth something, they also have universal applicability. And that's why having these kind of city to city exchanges is hugely important. So that's that's me for now. Thank you. Thank you so much to, to all of you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Anne. Thank, thank you, Patrick. So I'm going to just open up some of the, the issues now that, that came up in your presentations, broader, broader issues where there are points of connection and, and indeed tension. And just to encourage the audience, please use the q and I can see some questions already already coming in and, and a reminder that we'll, we'll, we're recording uh, this event too. So I mean, it's a natural place to start to think about the pandemic. I mean, that that's where this is this a lot of the culture has been sitting or on pause, on hold uh, for the last two years. And I'd like you, you've each touched on it in slightly different ways, both in terms of the opportunities and the challenges that the pandemic faced. But I, I wonder whether I might invite you to to think about recovery um, when we're thinking about culture and how um, culture in our cities can help with pandemic recovery and John you were talking there about repopulating the cities and the attempts to repopulate cities and that that struck me as being applicable here um how how do we reinvent culture in our cities in the light of the pandemic taking the best of it but also recognizing what it's taught us and and, and how we might rebuild John, should I come to you first? As you 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 touched on this just at the end and thinking about repopulation, it just just struck me as something we that might be applicable here. Thank you, Joe. Well, well, I think um, an immediate response to that, and this may be a, a, a very particular issue in in um, in London, but um, uh, what we're worried about what happens to our high streets, our shopping streets, because of the move to online retail, which in the UK has been particularly, I mean, I think even more than most other countries in Europe, it's been particularly acute. And so repurposing what our public streets are for is important. And one of the interesting things is that some uh, survey work demonstrates that we think people go to the shopping street to shop, but actually they very often go for all kinds of social and leisure and cultural purposes and just to kind of hang out. Uh, one of the initiatives that we've got going in London is a, a little scheme uh, employing 50 artists to work with streets of shops to think about how they can reanimate and regenerate what they're doing. Um, of course, in Paris, you've got this, I think, fascinating idea of the 15 minute city that Anne Hidalgo has been has been promulgating. And in a way, of course, the pandemic literally imposed the 15 minute city on many of us. So I think this thing of, uh, of maybe rethinking cities in, a, in, in quite a radical way. And I, 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 it's not, it's not uh, coincidental that this idea of in London of thinking, as well as having a 20 year plan for transport, we need to have a 20 year plan for culture. Part of that is because we now have this enormous transport infrastructure which is predicated on the assumption that hundreds of thousands of people will go from the suburbs to the middle of the city every day and go, maybe that is not the way it's going to be. That means our transport network and the billions and billions invested in it is redundant. Uh, uh, but, but we have to rethink these things uh, in, in, in terms of physical planning with conceptual planning, if you like, and cultural use. They have to be integrated. So uh, it does seem to me that Although there is a rush to get back to normal, 
it, it's also a great opportunity to be thinking rather more fundamentally uh, what, what cities might be looking like in 10 or 15 or 20 years. And, and interestingly, in the city of London, the, the, the corporation of London, uh, and you know, the, the, the square mile, as we call it, in the heart of the city, uh, has for all kinds of arcane and bizarre historical reasons, has got its own governmental structure. That has been absolutely dominated by finance for the last hundred years. But they are beginning to recognize that they have to rethink what their part of London is for. And the, the Lord Mayor of, of London City uh, recently set up a work, uh, workforce called Culture and Commerce, saying we have to rebalance uh, our being a financial and commercial center with being a cultural center. Otherwise, we're finished. And uh, I think that that is... Um, that's a, a little foretaste of how we need to be thinking much more widely that, that, the, that the physical structure we have and the social structure we have of cities in our minds need to be brought together for some radical rethinking and radical planning in the future. And of course, there again, I mean, universities and, and institutions that have got that kind of intellectual depth and rigor are going to be crucial to that process, but it has to be something that involves civil society organizations as well. Thanks, John. Anne, can I come to you? Because I was really struck by you know that parallel that you you have between the sort of the digital, but the way that we miss the face to face. Yes, I, I really thank you for for picking up a lot of the points. I see we're talking in the same language on these. We're one of the things that we're finding as we're going around France in a tour de France, looking in the regions, is that there is exactly what John's talking about. There is this idea that there's more centering around local and what can we do, and we see that across uh, the different regions in France with cities reconnecting and connecting differently, and saying, you know, we don't need to have all of the, the cultural policy coming out of out of Paris, for example, that we should really be doing some things here much more dynamically and there's a there's also a um i think a a drive for uh learning and doing so in other words reaching out to these communities where maybe the traditional um cultural institutions have been seen as not being accessible and to really get them engaged young people and others who wouldn't have normally wouldn't see themselves as part of an audience to get them actually engaged with the doing which then connects them with the idea of of um, you know, sort of that they are part of those cultural uh, landscapes too, and I I think that's one of the big drives we see also in education sector. Um, in fact, recently we participated with the city of Paris on a mission d'information et evaluation, where they're looking at. Um, how do you, from the crash or from the nursery school all the way through to university and into employment? create a pathway of cultural education, arts and cultural education. And it's not something, I mean, that certainly in the UK, we've done quite a lot of that work. It's a little bit newer and maybe in Berlin, I'm not sure where that stands, but it's definitely a trend that is going forward in Paris and in very many of the cities we've been visiting, where they're saying we can and should be engaging young people in the activities around arts and culture very young so that it becomes a part of how they identify and create their own self-esteem their connectivity with their community and with the others in the community and that 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 happens through the education process the university is playing a big big role in that and the arts and cultural institutions so i think this idea of creative industries and creative economy not just as sort of an end point that we're feeding into but as a journey that starts very very young and the way we're we're engaging all these different actors to participate in that space is definitely new and we definitely feel this is um, a big drive that's going on in in france and certainly in paris and the rest of the main cities patrick yeah, I think um, one of my biggest observations is that that the COVID-19 crisis sort of, first of all, let me take a look at Germany in this case. You know, Germany is, I mean, there's, uh, in the meantime, it's 11 billion euros of funding for arts and culture in Germany. So it's quite a big amount. But um, for a very long time, many institutions, you know, they were sort of, I would say, you know, they were comfortable <laughs> with the situation. So for sure, we were talking about diversity and audience development, you know, and all these buzzwords, but actually, to be honest, not so much happened, you know, in the general, for sure, there are always very good examples and great people and great institutions, but 
um, what we, for example, when we were talking about the relevance of arts and culture five years ago, most people would have said you cannot, and you cannot even ask this question. Sure, arts and culture are relevant. We, we do not discuss this question, but now we are able to discuss this question. And actually, uh, during the lockdown, we could see that actually in Berlin, arts and culture, they were not so very important to everybody. Everything was closed down and not, not people didn't go on the street to say, please reopen the cultural institutions. So the good thing is now we are all in the same boat. The artists, the big institutions, the smaller institutions, the private ones, the public ones. And what I can see now is there's a much more open discussion now. And uh, so because even the big theaters realized, okay, we have a problem now because we have lost our audiences. I would say maybe 50% in some cases, and they're not coming back because now they have a different, you know, they, they have different habits. They actually saw that it's also nice to have free time and stuff like that. So now uh, we have a much more open-minded discussion. And I think that's really fruitful because it all already uh, drives the institutions to think about, as, as uh, Anne said, um, about very interesting open-minded collaborations. They are opening their gates because they are realizing they have to. Because now they are in a, I would say sort of, they're not on a survival mode because the money is still there, but they sort of realized that they have to, you know, they have to move. So, so when we talk about participation, diversity, but also when we talk about digitalization, the question is what kind of roles want cultural institutions play in this discourse? Because we could see all this streaming stuff going on. I mean, it's, it's, it's just boring to see a theater play streamed one-to-one. -one. If you want to have something in the digital world, you have to produce something for the digital world because you're sort of in, uh, uh, you are competing with Netflix and these, these things. So uh, there was a big learning curve now. And so we can see that there are more and more institutions who find very good ways to, for example, integrate digital tools into the analog uh, world. So we can see a, a prospering process now of, of, of new concepts. And so this is something which is very positive. But on the other side, I'm still a bit worried about um, a lot of institutions, how they will sort of regain their audience. Uh, there's a lot of discussions going on, but, but we have to see and wait how it will uh, go. But, but I'm at least very positive about this now very open-minded discourse, even in Germany and in other countries in Europe anyways. Thank you so much. I mean, I think that's given us a lot of perspectives on, on, on the challenges there. But something that you're all talking about is about the multiplicity of actors. I mean, in that space, there are multiple actors, each with their own agendas. And, you know, I think those those institutions, I mean, we've been talking about the bigger institutions, smaller institutions, higher education, research, innovation institutions, they all come with their own agendas. And I think that's both an opportunity and, and a challenge. And I just wonder whether, whether there's a reflection for, from each of you on, on how, how you do this work really well in order to, to be for mutual enrichment, to use the phrase that, that John, John used. Um, so John, you talked a little bit about, you know, the ability to translate between these different communities, but but how do you manage uh, those those different relationships within this space? And are there things that we should be doing that we're not? Lost opportunities, things that ought to be happening, but where there are barriers. And can I come to you first on that one? Yes, I, I think. Um, well, it's a great question, full of full of very many facets. Um, you know, this is an experience that I think we're all creating as we go along. Um, I know we just recently did a workshop, I can't say who with, but we did a workshop that we hosted where we, again, held that space to be the convening. And the actors had started off working together and then somehow it fell apart. And we created this, this space for them to come back together again and to reimagine and revision, re if I could say that, after, after the pandemic. A possible future and in that we said maybe we should bring a lot of other actors very diverse actors into this as part of that it turned out that they were actually talking with some other actors again in the cultural space but outside of any of our 
uh, purview or vision, they each had been contacting this very same uh, part, potential partner who's overseas. And, and it was fascinating to see that what we were able to do in creating this, this kind of space for just an exploration and holding that space, it allowed them to actually envision the next steps. And we've now got a roadmap of how they can collaborate together. So I think part of what we need are the really good facilitators, the really good um, uh, inter what, what, what was, I, I think, described as these intermediaries. I think some of the calls, the open calls that are going on now that are being held, British Council, we've done some that have been very interesting and most of the cultural uh, ministries uh, are doing these things. They're allowing us to create new spaces where these kinds of interactions can happen. And because we do all now know, as, as rightfully Patrick has said, that we have to do something different. We're looking for the best practices. We're looking for the ways that others have done it. And that shared learning we're using to project ourselves into the new creative spaces, the new creative collaborations. And I think a lot of, of um, even new uh, uh, events, I was talking the other day because we have the Paris Olympics coming in 2024 and the Cultural Olympiad that's being worked up you know, around that frame that allows you to sort of throw out the rule book you can use it as the excuse if you will to do a pilot of something that maybe is outside of the usual organ uh, organized uh, cloison cloisonné or silos and that 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 rang a bell we can use that because it's a pilot so uh, giving some anchors that allow us to do things out of the box with a new set of collaborators and then the facilitation that can come with you know, some some really talented people that are around to 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 put that together. I think that that's a new recipe, if we could say that, for this launching ourselves forward into the planning that all of us are trying to do at this time. Patrick, I mean, presumably you you've got a without a, that kind of top down approach, you've got a bit more of that space that Anne's just described, or is it a different kind of challenge? No, actually, um, yeah, I think uh, as Anne already said, we, we need, I mean, we, maybe we need like two different kinds of arenas. Surely when, when I talked about cultural planning, is, even if it's participatory, is a, is, is, it is a set frame, it's a clear goal. We, the people are coming together, also universities to talk about the vision of cultural development. But I'm, I'm sure that we need more and more these, I would say, areas of exchange where we don't have to follow up goals all the time. Because, you know, in these settings, you always have to sort of fulfill a mission, accomplish a mission, you have to produce something. And for example, I give you a one very, uh, from, it was a really nice experience myself. When the Goethe Institute in Damascus had to close, two years later, um, the Goethe Institute opened a so-called uh, Goethe Institute in exile in Berlin for one month. It was like an open pop-up space for one month. And uh, I was uh, able to facilitate one workshop, which had no goal at all. And the great, great thing was that there came very different people together. I would say about 30 to 35 people from very different backgrounds, university background, individuals, artists. And actually there was one of, I had facilitated probably hundreds of workshops. And it was one of the most, uh, I would say impactful workshop for myself because we came up with so interesting topics and, and new ideas. And so I think what we need besides these, you know, very formal participatory areas, arenas, we need also more time, we all don't have mostly, <laughs> to come together and, and, and to discuss all these questions. We don't have any answers sometimes. So I think that's maybe also one thing which I can see slightly coming more and more through the digital space because you don't have to travel so much that I participated in some, I would say, web talks, the web exchanges who are, who went in a similar direction because some some of them are really nonsense from my, my, it's just a waste of time but sometimes you have really really good formats very 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 neat people you would never meet normally so so i still hope that the digital world gives us in this case maybe a new opportunity to to have these arenas because it's just more easy to come together this way even if it's not the same to meet physically thanks patrick john Oh, you're mute, John. Um, I, I, I was struck by what Patrick was saying about about this sort of open-ended with 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 the, the new possibilities, and it reminds me when the National Theatre in London began to 
put some of its plays out on television with a program called NT Live. I wasn't on live television, but they were made digitally available and could be screened in cinemas and so on. There was a piece of research which to the absolute fury of many people in theater came to the conclusion that the emotional intensity of the experience for people watching the screen version was often much greater than for people watching the live version. This you know, defied all the traditional canons of great art, but actually that's what people said. And it, and it made the National Theatre think quite hard about some of the things that it does. And I, so I think, you know, and in the same way that, you know, everybody, when television came along, everybody prophesied the death of cinema. Uh, you know, cinema is still with us and, and will be with us because it's a different kind of experience and people want a variety of different experiences and they, these things can kind of feed each other. And I, I, I just, was also thinking uh, there's a, an art center in London called Battersea Art Center, very creative, innovative art center. And they, their mission statement used to be inventing the future of theater. That was what they, that was their purpose. But partly because of all the changes that have been going on in the last couple of years, their new mission statement is to inspire people to take creative risks to shape their own future. Wow, I mean, the completely different purpose but it still has theater and the arts absolutely at its core, but they realize they need to reinterpret what they're doing. Uh, and, and I think if anything has happened during the lockdown, it's that the, the, the importance of culture and cultural activity in, in being the kind of the basic infrastructure that holds society together has become much more apparent. And, and if anything, it means that these discussions in terms of public policy are more important than they were before. And that, uh, terrifying as they may be because as you were saying Patrick you know you you have you doing work where you're not quite sure what the goal is is both energizing and terrifying but I mean maybe that's that's where we're at and uh, um, uh, it, it we just need to we need to explore that and, and see see where we go and and, and what's the, going to be the mixture of the kind of virtual and online and the, and the kind of real life uh, and, and how people, not only how people experience that, but also in very practical terms, how, how arts and cultural institutions are going to survive commercially in that environment in which uh, the way people engage with it are so radically different. I'm going to start pulling in some of the, the, the points coming uh, through the, the Q&A now. And it strikes me that there's a sort of cluster of questions that are coming around this notion of diplomacy and culture and its relationship with with diplomacy and knowledge diplomacy and 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 there's that there's a question for you in the chat around you know how the, the relations with the embassy so i think there's that there's a broader sense as to how what we're talking about here interacts with more traditional power structures and there we're talking about the embassy john your point about about soft power and and there's a point here uh, in the chat, which I think, Patrick, you're responding to at, at the moment around whether the city is the more, more powerful site for diplomacy and whether the city as a, as a cultural player will ever take over these bilateral relations. And can I come to you first, because the, the point was addressed about the, the embassy and we can take it from there. Yes, sure. Thank you, Russ, for the question. And, you know, today the British Council is a non-departmental public body uh, sponsored by the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office of the United Kingdom. So we are part of the UK in France or in Germany or in Spain or in Poland network, um, as Institut Francais and other cultural institutions are in the various places where they operate. So we work hand in hand with the embassy in areas that are, you know, uh, projects in the arts and cultural and educational space, but we are independent in the sense that, um, you know, we do operate in an area that is non, not political and um, you know, our, our strategies are developed and our programs are long term and we engage in relationships uh, across, uh, you know, very many years, topics, etc. So um, I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's the type of role that I think is ideal in that we can continue to do our work always in the cultural sector. But here in France, for example, we are a, 
a private company in France and we do have you know uh, projects that we've been working on for very many years and programs etc so the relationship is one of part of that UK in France uh, network and we work with the embassy on projects where it makes absolute sense for us to collaborate and then we continue to do things with our colleagues in Germany and other countries where we work regionally or globally on initiatives that um, maybe don't fit agendas of particular local embassies, but they do fit the long term interests of our countries to collaborate and of our peoples to meet one another and and work in these areas that are, um, you know, part of the cultural landscape. John. Uh, so I am um, I was I was reading some of the questions and answers and not paying attention. I'm sorry. I missed some of what you said, Anne. Or my apologies. But could I just pick the two two things in the in the questions that um, somebody put in something about uh, about an initiative in London last year, Brent being the borough of culture. There are thirty two boroughs in London, and we thought because London is so enormous, to have a city of culture program would be impossible. So we through the mayor's office we suggested that boroughs could compete to be the borough of culture and brent which is a very diverse uh includes a lot of suburban london the sort of 1930s metroland suburbs uh, not a particularly glamorous part of the city at all was the borough of culture last year and of course because of the lockdown and the pandemic the whole program had to be scrapped but what came out of it amongst many other extraordinary online initiatives was a group of young people who began a series of podcasts in conjunction with Vice, the online publisher. And, and out of that came this whole, this whole cohort of extraordinarily talented young presenters, some of them in their teens, creating vir a virtual cultural program online, which nobody had anticipated and nobody planned, but it kind of happened in the absence of anything else. So I think this thing of, of using these opportunities to create something new is uh, is is really powerful and and i'm, I'm sorry um joe i was I, I got absorbed in reading the questions and didn't pay any attention to your last question it was about um it was about this this notion of sort of diplomacy soft power and we've had a, a really interesting interventions on the quick q a now around you know that diplomacy is a form of representation, communication, or a negotiation, and it doesn't really matter, you know, which actors are undertaking it. So it was really around those the notions that, that you raised around around soft power and the role of culture in that, and moving that away from from that notion and into something rather different. Yes, but I, I think I mean I just come back to the thing about about the parity of esteem because I think you know in 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 culturally diverse uh situations you know and, and go back to indonesia classic example incredibly diverse society uh, uh, you know the largest muslim nation in the world but also with with big hindu and other uh minority faiths and communities actually the the, the cultural and creative space offers a, uh, a a neutral point in which there can be a kind of diplomacy which is not based on uh, trying to beat the other person in argument or convince them that you're right, but to genuinely exchange ideas, uh, and and I think that that's um, uh, that's a that's a hugely a hugely important issue to to um, to have that that kind of um, parity of respect. And the, the 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 guy who used to run the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK used to say, I'm all in favor of multidisciplinarity, but to be multidisciplinary, you have to have disciplines. And I think, uh, you know, and of course that's right. Otherwise you wind up with a kind of vanilla sludge that doesn't mean anything, it doesn't taste of anything. So I think that thing of, of having exchanges where you are looking for what are, the, what are the fruitful interactions rather than how do you win the argument mm -hmm. is, uh, is, is really crucial. Thanks. Patrick. Yeah, I don't have many things to add, uh, but um, I want to pick up this one thought. I think when we, when we come back to the topic of culture in the center, um, I actually agree that, that, that um, it's not so important at some times who is talking 
but it's rather important what kind of context do we have, uh, what kind of situation do we have. For example, um, for me, um, when I'm working in foreign countries, it's always very, very complicated because I don't, don't want to be this white German who tells anybody who, who is, uh, you know, who should do this and that. So the, the, the thing I'm pointing out all the time is that for, from my point of view, culture can be an area of, of peace, sort of, you know, very, very go out of certain um, contexts, where we try to be on an eye to eye level and very try to learn from each other. So, so from my point of view, this is one of the reasons why I'm working in this area, that um, culture can always offer, when we, when we are all open-minded and are openly talking about this, an area where we, where we come together and, and exchange thoughts. For example, as you know, Ukraine is uh, steering towards a new conflict, probably. And um, it was very, very important for all of us and all the participants in the last years that talking about cultural development always gave the people a platform sort of for exchange and peace at some point <laughs> and to have a positive mind to, to contribute to this development of society, even in very difficult times. So, so yes, um, I think um, sometimes it's not really relevant to who's talking. It's just important that people are talking about relevant themes. And Yes, I just want to maybe go into this topic of knowledge diplomacy and the words. Words always carry lots of meaning, as we know. You know, diplomacy, the idea of influence and that, you know, you're trying to influence a direction. We can look at it as the glass half empty or we can look at it as a glass half full. I mean, I think diplomacy is, is influence in a positive sense in that if we're listening and if we're part of the exchange of knowledge, then actually we want to be influencing and we want to be influenced. When I go to the theater, I want it to influence me. And likewise, I want to come out of that and talk all about it with my friends and colleagues and be influenced by and influencing them on my experience. And I think that's what knowledge, I, I happen to have you know, gone through the University of London. So I have this experience of you know, having to present my work and and of course, I want to influence in presenting my work and I want to be influenced by the colleagues who challenge me and come back and influence that work. I think that's what real knowledge diplomacy is. It's not the vision of diplomacy as we're trying to unduly influence, but that we're trying to mutually influence and create a new space together that doesn't exist if we don't come at it with intention. And so I like that aspect of knowledge diplomacy that really is a positive force for good and that we're trying to drive forward with ideas together and creating that new sense of, of, uh, of our culture together. John, you look like you were wanted to come in on, come in on that. You, you're, you're muted. You weren't a moment ago, but you are now. <laughs> And again, and again, still John, still muted. I'm still, oh. There we go, you're on. Don't okay, now I'm me. on. Okay, third time lucky. Uh, I wanted to say touche to Anne because I mean, she's absolutely right to, to make that point that actually, of course, this is about changing minds and not simply uh, uh, people retain their positions. And it reminds me, Yo-Yo Ma, the, the great um, Chinese American cellist, who has the most wonderful kind of fusion orchestra, if I can put it like that, uh, says, you know, creativity happens where cultures overlap. And I think, you know, that's a, that's a really nice way of putting it. But there, I, I also wanted to pick up, there's a, there's a point that's come up in the chat. Will global cities like London, Paris, and Berlin ever become more powerful and influential than states? I, I think, I mean, the answer is uh, in, in some ways, yes, because after all, culture is a dangerous thing to say but culture has always come out of cities i mean it's cities that created that have created most of most of a, a lot of cultural activity through throughout history and I, the thing that interests me is that is that how often cities are more progressive than national governments and if you think uh, i mean we're the mayor of budapest the extraordinary guy pitched up in london recently and he said how, how can you help us create an alliance of progressive cities. He said, yeah, we are in Hungary with Viktor Orban uh, running the country. Um, but the mayor of Budapest is, is on a very, very different agenda. And he was you know, in conversation with the mayor in Warsaw, the mayor in Prague and so on. And, and I thought how interesting that was because 
you know, the same thing in Brazil, Sao Paulo uh, is not going to bend down to Bolsonaro's crazy ideas about culture. And during the Trump presidency, it was some of the big American city mayors who said, you know, we're not, we're, we're, we're doing something completely different here. And it seems to me it's much easier to have these progressive, but also more engaged, lively, um, uh, and, and interesting conversations going on at the city level than at national level. So it, it would be nice to think that, that uh, I mean, I think at some level, it'd be nice to think that cities are gonna become more influential than, than countries. And I think in some areas, it's, it's, it's kind of true. And as the world urbanizes, that's gonna become more true. And I was just thinking, if you, if you think, um, you know, in Hong Kong, they, they've invested this billions in the West Kowloon Cultural District because they recognize if Hong Kong is going to establish itself as a, as a, a world leading city still, it has to have a strong cultural offer. And in, and in the UAE, in, they, they built this incredible cultural complex on Sadiat Island because they say, you know, we want this to be a, a, a cultural center because that's how we establish its seriousness in the world. And these are things that are happening at a city level rather than a kind of national level. Um, and, I, and I do think that's, that's I mean, that, that is fascinating. And the, the fact that uh, I often think, you know, a, a politician visiting another country 40 years ago would be taken to see a steelworks or a car factory or something. Now they're taken to the new opera house or the new museum or the new, you know, that's, that is what comes to represent power. I'm going to come back, John, I'm just going to hold you on that point for a second. I'm going to come back to this relationship between local, national, international in a second. But but I think there's just one thing I'd, I'd like to sort of slightly pick up on from, from the UK context, and that's the position of London within that national scene. And, you know, the city as driver of culture, of course, with levelling up in, in the UK, that creates a certain tension. And I just wondered whether you wanted to reflect on that. Uh, well, it's it's a huge problem, um, and uh, and it's one which uh, I have to say um, the mayor of the, the present mayor of London is acutely aware of that, and has and has a, a a group of all the other big metro city mayors in the UK to say how do we try with the powers that they have as mayors to try and uh, as he puts it defuse the animus against London. Uh, which is very powerful because our country has become massively uh, over-centralized to the huge disadvantage of the country as a whole. And, um, and of course, that's, that's about, it's about the economic uh, power balance. It's about the, the transport infrastructure. It's about, uh, about the way government revenues are deployed and so on. But it is a, it is a, it is a very big problem. And I, I think um, it, it does interest me that uh, that actually, for all that one could say in favor of it and against it, having elected mayors in some of the regional cities in the UK has undoubtedly helped to create a kind of focus for discussions that otherwise wouldn't take place. And 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 I'd say in Manchester and in Birmingham and in uh, and in some other you know Leeds, uh, there are several cities where and actually in Newcastle, Gateshead. There's a, there's a kind of energy. I mean, there aren't the financial resources there to make it happen, but there's a kind of energy and a cultural energy, which uh, still is massively discriminated against because of deeply inbuilt structures in our society. But I, I think that there's a, there's a recognition in every part of the political spectrum that what's there is unsustainable. And, and you know, we look at I mean, a country like Germany, where the, you know, the, whatever else you think of the lender structure looks like just a much more sensible way to organize a big country. Uh, um, uh, we've not we've not got there because well that's a longer conversation. That that, that leads me on really nicely to you, to you, Patrick. You know your map really exemplified these connections between the kind of hyper local, you know, and thinking about what was going on. The local, the city as a sort of portal out onto the onto the internet, the national and international. I wonder whether you wanted to offer a reflection of that sort of that line through the city from the hyper local to the international. Yeah, I think it's it's uh, it shows that I mean it's it's all connected to each other in this case because um, when you look at the networks uh, more closely, you can see that 
Um, not only big institutions always have all the, the connections. A lot of times when we do this network analysis, we find out that there's sometimes there's a single artist who has more connections all over the world because he produces or she produces something very special or is very good in, you know, actually arranging uh, networks. Uh, John, you, you use this very nice term of, of broker. A lot of times you have you have people who are actually very good in bro broker bro brokering these kinds of relationships. But I think at the end of the day, this is one of the future tasks that we talk about cultural planning that we have to take a much deeper look, not only on the local spheres, for sure we have to, this is the first step, but the second, second step has to be how are we interconnected within our countries? And then third step, how are we interconnected internationally? Because then it gets really interesting because there was one question in the chat, I just saw that how can we sort of make sure that the cultural activities and cultural institutions are more diverse in the future? And, and this is actually um, one of the most important, uh, I would say approaches that we, when we are naturally collaborate on an international level, it also will help us to get more diverse in our institutions. So, so because we, we do not only, you know, have to be sort of pressured to bring all kinds of diverse people into our institution, it gets more natural. And so I think uh, this, this aspect of, of uh, international collaboration is totally underestimated in these kind of uh, planning processes most of the times, but I think it's one of the most important ones. And, um, when we did, did these questionnaires, almost everybody we asked said, we are only at the beginning of international collaboration. That was very interesting for us. Even institutions who have a high, I mean, there are institutions like the really big ones who have a lot of money, they do not really collaborate. I mean, they buy and sell stuff internationally, <laughs> then we are very honest. But, but so, so to have a really you know, open-minded, fruitful international collaboration exchange, uh, uh, is a very, very important topic. Yes, thank you. Anne. Just very quickly, I couldn't agree more with what Patrick has just said. And yet I think there's a very hopeful side to this, which is, again, when we get out of Paris, which has a very similar kind of situation of being a magnet as London, and yet there's been a very affirmative effort to try to, you know, sort of change that. But when we get into the regions and we're meeting in different cities, whether it be in Rennes or in, you know, not, not just Marseille that has got a transformation undergoing, but in various um, cities across France, what we see is a real initiative around this internationalization as a way to um, stretch, if you will, from being tied in with the Paris, you know, the, too closely with the Paris institutions and really looking outside and saying what other partners could we imagine doing things with and there's a lot of great experimentation there's a challenge in funding i think we really need to look at that how do we put together the matching of the funding and they don't have the administrative resource to do all that so it's a technicality but we need to understand how do we create that ability for these organizations to do it but there's an appetite for it i couldn't agree more and many of them are finding ways to overcome those obstacles i think the dyna dynamism in the smaller and mid-sized cities is absolutely amazing in the cultural sector and i really think there's a lot of hope there that we're, we're turning the corner on the subject that um and and with this diversity agenda obviously in reaching new publics and audiences post-pandemic I think they've got a lot of room to get out there and do things that maybe before they didn't have a chance to do. Can I can I follow up on that, that Anne? Just to, to pick up on that representation, you know, adequately and effectively represented in, in cultural activities and policy and how, how to do that. What's the experience of Paris? In terms of the diversity agenda, I think yeah. that's, that's obviously one of the areas that, you know, the, there's a looking at best practice outside. Again, I mentioned that we've we've certainly been asked to present some of the experience from the UK in this area. I think the Olympiad and the Paris Olympiad and the, sorry, excuse me, the Para Olympiad in London in 2012 offered a real opportunity for the cultural sector to also come together and learn about how do we work with arts and disabilities? How do we work with inclusion? And um, there was an, a, a tremendous effort to really address that topic and then to take that learning and start sharing it. So with the British Council, I know that we've just had and launched and we can put in the chat and in notes about how we've just launched a big 
um, uh, project Time to Act, which is a report on the learnings out of that across a number of countries. And it's really fascinating to see how there's now interest in really taking the lessons learned and trying to apply them in different contexts with different challenges. But I think there's a lot of openness for that now. And again, of course, we're all inheriting um, a situation that is, is now no longer sustainable and no longer desirable. So, but how do you make it still with the qualitative um, you know, standards that are in the sector? How do we actually do that? And I think a lot of institutions, I'll just men mention another one, which is Maison La Danse in, in Lyon, which has uh, taken a very important initiative to reach out to different communities and expand their audiences and get young people coming into the dance sector. Um, and the, the directrice uh, of the Paris uh, 2024 Olympia, Dominique Yarvieux, has just been announced after leaving Paris, uh, sorry, as for leaving Maison La Danse, she'll be heading the the culture uh, sector for the Paris 2024 Olympiad. So I think we're seeing the recognition of what people are doing in region that is, is expanding this and coming into the to Paris landscape as well. John, you wanted to come in, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, underpinning this whole conversation is our assumptions about how we define culture, isn't it? And I just, the, the Museum of London has just made a beautiful little film called Eleven which is about 11 community football teams in London. One, a, a team run by, a, a team for over 80s, a team for people with physical disabilities, a team which is all the Metro drivers on the underground who play in a league together. And I defy anybody to watch that film and not be moved by it. It's the most powerful statement about the significance of cultural activity, which has got no public engagement and no public profile whatsoever, but is actually underpinning what's going on. And it also makes me think, I, I was a youth worker in, in East London working with the Bangladeshi community in the 1970s. And, uh, and the Arts Council used to say, we don't get any applications from the Bangladeshi community. Oh, well, the, the, the Bangladeshi community was organizing fantastic, extravagant dramas where they would fly in stars from Bangladesh and fly in costumes from Bangladesh. No money from the Arts Council, all paid for by the community. So this kind of rich, cultural life going on but it was not accessible to anybody outside that community because they didn't particularly want it to be and I think we you know so one of the things again we've been trying to do in London is to say is not to impose a definition of culture on what goes on in the city but trying to so mapping it was to try to find out what's going on and where it is useful for public policy and public money to assist and where it's more useful for it to stay away uh, and simply simply ensure that there is space there for activity. I mean, it's an obvious point to make, but I think you know we've we've taken that for granted in this conversation. Uh, all the points about d diversity and so on. Thank you very much. I think as we're coming to to the end of our our time here to today, so I would just like to thank John, Patrick, and Anne for their very rich uh, contributions and for bringing all of their experience to bear on this central and, and, and critical problem for the development of our cities in relation to, to knowledge diplomacy. So thank you all very much. That was an incredibly wide ranging discussion. It was absolutely fascinating and seeing the, the points of comparison and tension between the three cities is incredible, but we didn't stay within the cities. We, we ranged quite, quite widely. Uh, internationally and I think I think uh, John will all go away now and, and log on to the Museum of London and, and watch watch 11 I think that's something that we're going to do straight away so thank you all so much and thank you to our sponsors to and to the University of London in Paris for organizing this incredible series I just want to remind everyone that the next knowledge diplomacy seminar is going to take place on Wednesday the 9th of March and the topic there will be appropriately cities as sites of knowledge creation and exchange you can register as as for here uh, you can register now on eventbrite so thank you so much to to everyone for joining us today thank you for your questions and thanks especially to our three panelists thank you and enjoy the rest of your afternoon wherever in the world you are thank you